as Angie says, I've uh, been here in the market for uh, quite a while, in Dallas for 30 years now, and part of uh, Tech Titans uh, for uh, much of the time that it's been in existence. So I've really enjoyed uh, being a part of this community. Uh, it's awesome. We have some wonderful, uh, ex uh, talented people in this industry, uh, in this area here. So um, today I'm going to talk about, I'm going to run through this pretty quick. Y'all have seen parts of this before. Uh, if you want more information, I'll have it out there on, the, uh, uh, on my LinkedIn profile. Uh, pretty easy to find, just look for Ebb Hightower. And, uh, you can uh, take a look. I'll, I'm recording this, so hopefully if you want to, you can take a look at it in a week or so uh, when I edit it. I'm going to run through kind of a brief history real quick, break down the Internet of Things and what I think the, the major components are. But I'm going to talk about some of the other technologies that are being brought to the Internet of Things that are going to make it much more efficient and more effective in how uh, services are delivered. So uh, the Internet is awesome. Google is incredible at the amount of information they should get. I want to give credit to the people that I've borrowed their information from. The first example of an Internet of Things device or machine-to-machine -machine, uh, device is the telegraph. It was built back in 19, or 1832 by two Germans, and then uh, Samuel Morse added his Morse code onto that, and it created our communications uh, what we have today was the beginning of, of what's uh, an incredible amount of information. I love Nikola Tesla. He foresaw the future with our smartphones in our pocket and the internet to creating a, a, a worldwide brain. A pretty incredible what he's done. The old days, <laughs> Internet of Things before it was called machine to machine even, was sometimes called tele telemetry, SCADA, uh, industrial automation, telematics, and sensor networks. And it used various technologies such as wireline and microwave and then private radio and then the Wi-Fi satellite and cellular, traditional cellular. So uh, if you were going to look at a definition of the Internet of Things, it can get very complicated. I boil it down. I think the Internet of Things is really about remotely monitoring and then possibly controlling objects or devices in the field. What you do after that is add technology at each step along the way to make it more complex and make it do more things, help you analyze what's going on out there. But the, if you were to boil it down, that's what it's about. So it's going to become our nervous system of the, of the world. We're going to be able to know things and, and track things that we've never been able to do before and make reasoned and, uh, analysis and understand and predict uh, things that are going to happen in the future and uh, re take appropriate uh, reactions beforehand. So <laughs> the ecosystem is very complex. There is no one company that has a solution for everything from end to end. So what we've got is a very complex uh, ecosystem out there that's being created and people have to partner up. So I kind of boil it down. There are three parts of the internet as far as I'm concerned. There's the end devices and sensors, there's some sort of connectivity, and then there's the back end. Each of them are rich in what they, they can provide and the technologies that are involved in each one of those. Uh, and the back end is incredible with all of the analysis and software and storage and cloud and all the things that go in there. But I'm a wireless guy. So I'm going to talk about uh, the connectivity part here for mostly, but I'm going to talk about some other technologies that are going to add capabilities uh, to the whole thing. And as I said in the past, we've got all these different types of technologies. Uh, so wireline, oops, microwave, uh, radio, traditional cellular, 2G, GPRS, uh, and now 3G and LTE, short range technologies like Wi-Fi, Zigbee, and uh, Bluetooth and whatnot, and then satellite. The problem with uh, traditional cellular is that it's expensive and it's power hungry. So 2G is being taken down in the United States. It's still available in some other parts of the world, but it's not a great technology for the low power devices that we're needing to add to the sensors uh, out there and be able to, to send information in. The uh, Wi-Fi mesh, the short range technologies have their place, but they have restrictions as well. So it's not a great... Uh, I, it, it, Putting together a broad area cover, coverage with short range technologies is a management issue and gets very expensive when you start doing that. Private radio uh, has its place. That's how I got started uh, over 30 years ago at Motorola uh, selling uh, machine to machine capabilities. But private radio is not ubiquitous. And it's a horizontal, a kind of a silo kind of application, not a vertical that, I mean a horizontal that we're looking, the Internet of Things is becoming a horizontal uh, play. And then satellite is wide coverage, but it's very expensive, both in power and in cost. So I, I have studied the low power WAN area, and there's a lot of uh, players in this space. I'm going to talk a little bit about them for a moment. They're one of the technologies that, have, that will enable us to create connections, billions of connections around the world, to devices that are going to be low power in consumption. 
Now, the definition of low prior wide array networks is that it's long range communications. But the devices use <coughs> as, little, as, as little amount of power as possible. So their power consumption is very low. That allows the batteries to last a long time. You want them to last at least five years. Optimally, optimally you would like them to last 10 years because a lot of these places you're going to put sensors. You don't want to go back there. They're ugly, they're hor uh, hazardous uh, areas. Uh, they're just hard, hard to get to. So once you put it in, you want to leave it there as long as you can you have to, before you have to go back and change the battery. You want to create an infrastructure that's uh, low uh, cost. You want to be able to have a scalable system so it can handle the billions of devices and the messages that they're going to create. And you want it to be reliable communications. Now the mobility part depends on your application and the technology that you use for that particular solution. Uh, not all low power WAN technologies are going to support mobility uh, in the true mobile sense as it's moving through the, uh, uh, the coverage area. Now it turns out low power wide area networks can cover 86% of all uh, applications out there if it's 3 megabytes or less. And 86% of them require 3 meg megabytes or less. But what's interesting is that 76% require 1 megabyte or less per month of, of the communication of transmissions and messages. So uh, low power winds are ideal for a lot of IoT applications. And in fact, 60 to 80 percent, according to the analysis uh, of this company, uh, Simtech did this, uh, the low power WANs will handle 60 to 80 percent of all applications out there. Cellular, the tr traditional cellular that we know about, will handle, uh, have its place. And then the short range uh, Wi Fi and Bluetooth will have its place as well. But the predominant will be low power WANs. Now, the cellular guys are getting into low power WANs as well. I'll talk about them in a second. So these are the true low power WAN guys that I've uh, uh, been keeping up with. So Laura is the big dog out there right now as far as low, low power WANs go. There's actually two parts to the Laura network. The Laura is actually uh, the radio signaling protocol, and the Laura WAN is the oops, is the uh, MAC layer, the networking layer that sits on top of the signaling protocol down below. So the LoRa is actually owned by Simtech and they license this out. So if you buy a radio device, uh, it is owned by Simtech, at least the, the IP for that technology. Uh, they've done a great job though of creating a huge ecosystem of <coughs> hardware providers, software providers, network providers, and then India industry associations that support their, uh, their spec whatnot. Uh, and the spec is particularly applied to the, the map layer above. So they are, have done a great job They've got, uh, of creating this support system, and it's uh, relatively good now, it's going to get better. It is a full two-way system, uh, it uses spread spectrum, and I'll talk about that in a second here more. Uh, <coughs> Laura, Laura Wins is the generic map layer that sits on top. The Laura Alliance, is made up of all the industry players that uh, want to help make this uh, Mac layer better. So the latest version of it is improving its, its uh, ability to acknowledge messages and improve the quality of service uh, and allow firmware over the air. Until it's fully implemented, it has issues. It has a lot of collisions. Uh, it's not as reliable it, as it needs to be. If you need something right now to be reliable, then there are Link Labs has created a layer that's proprietary, but it takes care of all those issues. It's 100% acknowledgement, it has a high quality of service, and it does photo firmware over the air so that you can download updates to your device, security patches or firmware patches to the devices out there. So if you need it now, you can get it proprietarily. In the future, we'll have the ability to, to support that. Great system. Uh, it's proprietary at the, at the link layer, or at the uh, physical layer. Uh, but these, their licenses get out, so always getting better all the time. There's two ways to implement low power WANs. The uh, Laura guys do spread spectrum. So they got started uh, during the war, uh, Cold War. Qualcomm created spread spectrum technology, and with our spooks would use it to communicate. The Soviets were looking, and they couldn't see, they knew we were transmitting, but they couldn't find it. Well, it spread the signal out over several uh, megahertz in some cases. Uh, and then they code it and then decode it to the other end. It's actually below the noise floor, so it's, uh, it's a very powerful technology. Their implementation is called CHIRP spectrum. It's not as good as it could be, but it's, it's okay, and they're making it better by improving the map layer. 
The other approach, oops, the other approach is to put all your signal strength into a, a narrow part of the band called narrow band, or in some cases ultra narrow band, and you punch through the the uh, interference in the in the spectrum and to get your range. And that's what these next guys do. You've probably heard of Sigfox. Uh, they are ultra narrow band. And so uh, they're a proprietary protocol. They've tried to put in a network around the world. They had to base it on the European standard, which requires that you can do 140 messages upstream from the device to the base station, but you can only respond from the base station 1% of the transmission time. Now that turns out to be a very restrictive uh, requirement. And uh, their link budget, the amount of energy that gets transmitted up is much higher then they allowed link budget back down. So they have a lot of issues in trying to make it two-way. So it's basically a one-way system. Uh, it's got its followers, but it's very limited in its applications. Uh, they were out there early. They've built up a lot of uh, investment in their company. We'll see how well that turns out. These guys are the dark horse out there. I followed them. They've been, uh, it took them seven years to do research at Ofcom, which is the UK's FCC, and, uh, and they've done the last five years perfecting uh, this capability. It's the third generation of the, the standard. This company, Ubik, U-B-I-I-K, out of Taiwan, this is an open standard. Anybody can build to the standard. Uh, Ubik has, is the first one to do that. They just won a million meters at Taiwan Power to install. If this goes well, which the testing they did very, very well. And that's why they won one of five awards, but they got a million uh, devices they're going to install. Once they get that behind them, then they'll branch out, uh, move outside of that, uh, Asia, and come to the States. So I'm talking to them about helping bring them, but they're not ready yet. But this is a great technology, very high performance, very adaptive. It can go, because it's a narrow band approach, it's actually 12.5 kilohertz wide, so some frequencies require very narrow band. Some frequencies allow you to gain them together. You can go up to 100 megahertz wide, 100 kilohertz wide, uh, and improves your, your uh, throughput capabilities. And so very adaptive in what it can do. It's relatively long range and very low power. So it has a lot of good characteristics. It's just way behind the, the curve. Early adopters have already moved to Laura and Sigfox and some other uh, technologies. Uh, it's just very good. I worked with Ingenue for a while. This is like Betamax and VHS. These guys put 300 person years into developing the technology and, and field testing it and improving it. Uh, they brought it to market. They tried to put it in a network throughout the whole United States and then license it to put it in around the world. It's awesome in the, in the abilities that it has. They ran out of money. So they are pulling their horns and they're doing it on an as uh, needed basis. Uh, where people want to put in uh, specialized systems. Um, we'll see if they, they are able to regain some momentum. Uh, great technology, not, not a good business model. Uh, so, but this is the gorilla in the room though. The cellular guys with their IoT approaches. So these two approaches, LT, LTEM, also called CAT-M1, uh, <coughs> electronic machine type communications, and narrow band IoT, NB-IoT, or CAT-M2, are true low-power WAN approaches. This third uh, version is called Citizen Broadband Radio Service. It just got approved two months ago uh, here in the States. And I'll talk about that more in a moment. This could be a real uh, powerful approach to IoT and private radio networks as opposed to cellular carriers. So, LTEM. It's a reduced bandwidth from the standard LTE signal, which is 20 megahertz wide, 1.4. So it makes it easier for them to put this into their existing network structure. It's also a software download for most of the carriers to their base station. So it's pretty easy to implement. Uh, it can go up to a, a megabyte per second, but the typical range is 200 kilobits to 400 kilobits, which is very useful for a lot of applications. Uh, they think the battery life will be five years. It doesn't have real-world experience yet, so we'll have to wait and see if that true is true. It supports true mobile applications. So if you've got supply chain and you're trying to track a package, it can keep up with it as it's moving on the truck and whatever other device uh, <coughs> it might be on. Uh, so it's got its applications there, but it's pretty power-hungry since it's only five years. Uh, you've got to look at the use case to make sure it's the right technology for you. 
AT&T and Verizon and Sprint are implementing uh, LTE-M uh, in the United States. Since it's just a software download, uh, it's easy to get up and working. The rest of the world is also putting it in, uh, so it's a matter of time. Uh, they will uh, get it out there. The narrow band IoT approach is uh, more like LoRa and Weightless and Ingenue uh, in that it's fully two-way. This is part of the 3GPP. The 800 carriers and other entities belong to the 3GPP uh, standards group. Uh, they've all agreed on this standard. Uh, it takes more work, though. You've got to do them. Phys you have to go in and physically change the infrastructure somewhat to be able to support NB IoT. Uh, but it is much more power conservative. Uh, it is better for a lot of a lot of messages, but short messages. Uh, and it doesn't have the mobility capabilities, but it reaches deeper into buildings, into basements and vaults and things like that because of the, the protocol that they use. So it's very, uh, very interesting. These guys have, they want to get into this market big time, so they're going to put a lot of weight behind it, a lot of marketing behind it, and they'll improve the spec and, the, and improve the ecosystem support for it. So it's just a matter of time before they are probably the dominant choice, NBIOT and LTEM, and then the LoRa's and the Wakeless and the Sigfox and whatnot will be adjuncts to that. If you all know IoT America, uh, Pete Denegi's uh, capabilities, he is using LoRa to reach out from the farmhouse, as an example, out to the rural uh, the, the, the farmland and the ranch and whatnot to uh, monitor and control things. But for his backbone, he uses the cellular uh, carriers out in these rural areas. But, so that's what we're going to kind of see. We're going to see a combination of these uh, technologies to solve problems. Uh, great. Uh, they put a lot of thought into the way the spec is written, so it has a lot of advantages. Uh, right now, it's uh, the networks are designed for smartphones, so it's going to take a while for them to, to find and retrofit their networks and find space in their frequency plans to be able to put this uh, in. But it's a matter of time. What we're seeing, if you want to compare them, there's a lot of charts out there uh, to compare the two, LTE, M, and NBIOT. What's interesting is the purple are countries that are putting in both LTE, M, so the United States uh, and uh, I think that's Greece and then Australia, are putting in uh, both LTE, M, and NBIOT in the United States is being put in by T-Mobile at 600 megahertz, they got some frequency band at 600, which is an awesome band for long range and penetration. The higher you get in the frequency band, the more it acts like light. So your penetration and range uh, decrease. So anything above a megahertz has got uh, some issues with getting penetration and distance. But 600 megahertz is great. So T-Mobile's got their NBIOT on that. DISH is installing NBIOT systems as well in the United States. In the rest of the world, with this uh, blue, Europe, uh, Brazil, China, they're putting in just NBIOT. So they are committed to doing low power, truly low power networks in their countries. They may eventually put in LTEM, but that's not their focus. So if you were to compare them, I'm not going to do that, but uh, Sigfox is very low power consumption and relatively very low in its ability to transfer information, its transfer speed. You go up the line, LoRa is better. It can be very low power and still communicate uh, a lot of information. Uh, this is Ingenue's RPMA. It a, has a very good profile. Weightless has a, a very incredible pro profile. So depending on your needs, it can be very low power and very low usage, or very high, high power and very uh, high in its transfer speed. And then you got into the carriers, NBIOT and, e, and, uh, uh, and LTEM is what this stands for. So there's still fairly power hungry at the moment, uh, but they can transfer a lot of information. So it kind of depends on what your needs are as to what makes sense and what the, who you're buying is from uh, and, and which network, which ecosystem you want to be plugged into. So this is interesting and exciting. The third option I told you about there with the cellular guys is Citizen Broadband Radio Service, CBRS. So it's at 3.5 gigahertz. Now, as you go up, it gets harder for gold range and, and penetration, but your power is pretty high for this. So, it's a, it's a, FCC calls it the great experiment. They've never done this before this way. So, 3.5 is used by 
the Navy fixed satellite and wireless ISPs. They are incumbents. So they get top priority. If they are using that frequency, they will never be, no one will be allowed to interfere with them. The next group down is called the PAL group, Priority Access, oh, what is PAL? Priority, P -A -L, Priority Access Licensees. They will be controlled by either Google or Comscope, who will put monitors, the Navy does this along the, along the coasts for some of their operations. The Google and Comscope sensors will be along the coast, and when they sense the Navy using the 3.5 gigahertz, whatever frequencies they're using, they will turn off the ability for the PALs to be able to use those particular frequencies while the Navy or any of these other incumbents are using those frequencies. Very interesting. We got the FCC, that's why it's a great experiment. The FCC will have to wait and see if the, uh, if the technology is reliable and does what the Navy needs it to do. Uh, you, Tom? You mean com, com search? Com scope. Not com search? No. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure I got that right. Com but, search uh, are the guys that control the licenses. And that's just a, uh, they're an extension of what they're doing. We'll, we'll go look it up. I think it's com, and I thought it was comscope. But um, then the third area is GAA, General a Authorized Access, GAA. That's like high-powered, uh, it's like Wi-Fi on steroids. <coughs> they have no rest <laughs> they have no, con no protection. They also have no restrictions. You don't have to get licensed, but you do have to get certified. So if you buy equipment to put it in for a solution, if it's certified, you're done. You just put it in and, and work. But you have to accept interference from either of these two guys, or, and you cannot interfere with them. If you've certified that it's supposed to be low-powered up, that you, they won't be affected by it. So the incumbents uh, are grandfathered in, uh, Navy, uh, fixed satellite, and, and wireless ISPs, and they get protection from everybody. Uh, this is just another way to look at it, the PALs and the GAAs. There are 100, it is 150 megahertz wide that, that has been allocated at 3.5, 3.55 to 3.7 uh, megahertz, which is awesome. They, the FCC is going to allocate 70 megahertz to the P, PALs, and they're going to auction off these 70 megahertz in 10 megahertz segments. So carriers can buy or lease, it actually going to be for 10 years they're going to be able to get the allocation at 10 megahertz uh, chunks for 10 years, and this can offload then a lot of smartphone uh, traffic, if that's what they want to use it for, or it can be used for IoT applications, which is exciting for us because this may become a very useful uh, band because of its bandwidth and its ability to support uh, remote sensors, particularly video which is a hard to do thing for any of the other technologies. They want short messages. Video is not something they can do. This is, uh, is, could be used for that. Uh, remote sensing and then video streams or whatnot. Uh, so the general access is 80 megahertz wide. All you need to do is to buy equipment and, and go into this frequency band and you're up and working. You have to accept the interference, so that could be a, a, an issue. But we've already seen for the 900 megahertz equipment and then some of these other frequency bands that are unlicensed, there are technologies out there that can deal with interference. As long as latency, you can tolerate some latency, then this is not going to be a problem. It's just a matter of using, choosing the right technology to be able to deal with the harsh environment that you're, you're in there. Hey, Ed, I've got a question. Sure. So, so this spectrum at CBRS is really going to be treated no different to the carriers than they're used to, where it's going to be, it's free, but it's for bid, and, you know, carrier X is going to bid on it, and they'll win it, and they'll win it for whatever, 10, 20 years, ten years. like in the past, right? 10 years with an expectation of being renewed. This is all in the, they've been negotiating this for over a year or longer, but the last year there's been intense. And uh, there's been a battle going on between the WISPs and other uh, people that wanted to use this fre these frequencies and whatnot and not give the carriers advantage. So it did a, a lot of compromises. 
So it's free for everybody that's on it today. That it, they either with or or are they paying yeah. the government? Yeah. Uh, in the past, the incumbents got it by just applying, and the old way of doing got things, it. FCC, is you apply yeah. if you qualify, then you get the frequencies. If you're justified to be able to be in there, and the new way is always auctions. So, so governments are freeing it up, and then they're going to put it out for auction. Right. So 70 megahertz is going to be up for auction. 80 megahertz is free, and you have to deal with interference. Uh, so. Stere the Wi-Fi on stereo switch you can think of. And a Say, related, related question. I'm, I'm still trying to get a little <coughs> model in this. When the third tier guys get disrupted, they're still operating, but just in a high interference environment? Or is this yes. like Wi-Fi DFS where you have to move off? That's what's going to happen is you're going to have to employ technologies that sense interference and deal with it, either reconstructing your signal with foreign error correction or moving to another frequency. Are, are dealing with uh, retransmissions, that kind okay. of thing. Yeah. So it, essentially their availability percentage will go down. But it, yes, go latency down, was what's going to show up. It will go down as a function of the device shutting itself down. Uh, it will adapt. The device will not shut down. It will just keep trying or adapt to a new frequency, that kind of thing. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is artificial intelligence. It's a, a force multiplier. You can add this into your networks, and you're going to be able, at, if you add artificial intelligence at the edge, you're going to be able to uh, filter, let's just go to it. You're going to be able to filter the data. So right now, our de remote devices just transmit everything up. Whatever they need to, they do. But if you're looking at uh, a remote area, and every time that, that something happens, it's not, you don't need to always transmit up things to the, to the cloud. So if you could filter that data at the remote site and choose what is already, what, what is useful and what can be thrown away, then you can cut down on your amount of data that's uploaded to the uh, internet and to the cloud, you reduce your cost of transmission, it reduces latency because if you've got a, a remote processing, artificial intelligence is one example, then you can make decisions right then and respond right then. So you've reduced the latency instead of going back up to the cloud, waiting for a decision and coming back. Uh, and it, it can, uh, by having intelligence or processing capabilities at the edge, you're able to make that analysis very quickly and then speed that up. You also improve your security because you reduce the vector points for cyber hacking for the transmission part and for your back end. Everything is right there at the remote site. Uh, so you can harden that. Uh, and not have all these other areas we have to worry about. All right, so uh, what was interesting is many people have said if you put AI in the cloud and someone like uh, Amazon or Microsoft or Google creates a powerful AI that everybody goes to, that's where everybody, that particular AI will become the dominant force in the world. They're, they'll be the ones that control and make all the money. Well, Dan Woods with Forbes looked at that and goes, no. If you put AI at the edge, then every applica many applications are very different. So your artificial intelligence at the edge is going to be different. There's going to be many people playing in that area. So that's where, all the, where a lot of the money is going to be. By 2020, we're going to see 18% of all total infrastructure uh, being put into AI at the edge. So uh, processing at the edge. <clears throat> so the AI here is not going to dominate in the, in the cloud. It's going to be the people that are putting it in edge applications. So one example is to, uh, to add that. If you do that, add AI with computer vision, then you could do things like driver monitoring uh, systems. So in a cab, you've got a, a commercial driver, and uh, you're there. It's like something like 20 or 30% of them suffer from narcolepsy. So if you've got a camera watching them, you can see if they start nodding off. The AI can immediately alert them. If they're looking at their video, uh, at their smartphone, you can immediately tell them, uh, wake up, wake up, uh, don't be looking at your phone, look up. They actually applied this to the, I don't know if you've seen this, this is the Uber driver in, in Phoenix that drove uh, a level three autonomous car. She was actually looking at her smartphone, a video, and she hit the gal pushing the bicycle across the street and killed her. When uh, this company, Edge Sensor, added their technology to the video stream 20 seconds before she hit the the person driving the uh, pushing the bike alarm could have gone off and said stop looking at your phone look up look up uber engineers had disconnected 
the computer system from the braking system because of some erratic driving that they had earlier in the week. And she, as level three, she was responsible when the computer couldn't do anything, she was supposed to take over. She's watching this video and uh, didn't see the gal until it was too late. So it's that kind of thing you can apply it to. So um, I, whatever. <laughs> Uh, I'm done. <laughs> it's your turn, Jerry. <laughs> the idea out at the end, anyway. So these are other applications for uh, artificial intelligence. And so Jerry's going to talk about some more examples here. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate it. So uh, as I'm coming up, uh, Andy, I want to also say that you've made me realize that I need to update my LinkedIn profile. You know, about 12 years, I think I had to had to put that out there, and I uh, realized this morning that I need to make an update to that. It was very good, but not nearly as long as that. So, um, I first want to say thanks for allowing me to be here. Um, you know, many, many years ago, I forgot about the MTBC until uh, I heard it again this morning, but uh, many years ago, I was involved uh, with this group when I was at Digital, a small company back then called Digital Realty Trust. Uh, as you heard on my nonprofit, I, I took a took a step away from for-profit work and went into nonprofit, and then uh, a couple of years ago, my wife uh, decided it was time for me to go back into for-profit work. So. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to say is uh, my very first boss in technology in 1993 told me that I should never be the smartest person in the room. So, wonderful day. I'm not the smartest person in the room, but I don't think he understood uh, and didn't give me the, uh, the correct disclaimer that if you're the speaker, then maybe you should be the smartest person in the room. <laughs> but um, uh, but I, I, I appreciate being here. Um, so, so the part that I uh, was asked to come in and, and talk about, you know, was some uh, were some of the use cases of edge processing and artificial intelligence at the edge. Um, didn't realize it till this morning, but both Ed and I are going to talk a little bit about Edge Tensor. Um, I've got uh, kind of one of the use cases there as well, so I'm glad he kind of led into that. But uh, but I've known a lady over there named Kay Shaw for a long time. Uh, they're doing some really neat stuff, so I wanted to. To, to make sure that I, uh, I added her in. But the first question that I want to ask, um, how many of you are educated and familiar with the fog? Cisco. Awesome. <laughs> so so when, when I look at edge computing, you know, one of the conversations is what really happens at the edge, what's in the cloud, and now there's this new term called fog computing and that basically is you know I'll show a, an example of it uh, in my third slide and a true application but essentially it's the it's the data that happens between the cloud and the edge so some sensors aren't smart enough to do computer on their own but the cloud is too far away to offer that compute capability so we're starting to bring concepts of micro data centers uh, my friend Cole over at Vape, Vapor IO starting to put containerized data centers at the bottom of the cell phone towers, things like that. And that would be a true fog um, uh, capability. We could, we could argue whether or not um, uh, that is true edge capability, but in my world, uh, you know, we're, we're doing control systems on a light pole and I am doing true compute technologies at the light pole, then therefore I want to say that that, that that data center at the cell phone tower is actually, you know, in the fall. So, you know, uh, there was only a few hands up, so I guess the question of are they the same or not is probably irrelevant, but one of the, the talking points in the industry that many people see the edge and the fog is the same thing. And I think in, in, in this part of the conversation, I want to make sure that we differentiate those two out because as Ed said earlier, you know, some of the processes are happening out there at the, at, at the sensor um, and then some of those are moving inward, inward to the cloud. Uh, but, but as we see uh, on, my, on my next slide, we'll see that, you know, timing is, is a requirement. So, so we're having to bring that out to the edge. 
And I know, um, gosh, uh, I first want to say, are we really going to be talking about cars again? Um, but when we talk about compute at the edge, you know, I want to state that the, the car as a supercomputer is the epitome of that, um, that profile. You know, currently in today's world, you know, we, we do have these level three, level five autonomous vehicles, but one of the biggest things that they're doing right now is they're gathering data and sending it back so the next version of autonomous vehicles and driverless cars know, uh, know and understand road data. Where are the potholes? Um, I can't make a left-hand turn on this road. Um, and, and so that's where, you know, when we talk about the car as a supercomputer, that's really kind of where we are now. But a couple of, you know, a couple of interesting uh, tidbits. You know, uh, uh, was doing some research, and, and you know they're saying that on the average it takes 100 milliseconds to get data between the car and the cloud. Well, if we're there on the highway and there's been a wreck or that pedestrian just jumped out in front of us, that car does not have the time to transmit that data to the cloud and then back and then act on it. You know, we're at 220, 250 milliseconds at that point. Unfortunately, at that time. Um, we've we possibly already had an accident. So, so when we talk about true edge computing, that car as the supercomputer, we're having to build that type of uh, uh, smarts into the car so that it can react immediately. And and that's the true epitome of what I'm going to call edge computing. That you know, doing something without having to send that packet back to the fog or or back to the cloud. Uh, a couple other things, and of course, there's some old old data in here. But but you know, Toyota predicts that there's going to be 10 exabytes of data per month coming from that car. And very similar to what Ed said earlier, a we just don't have the time capabilities, nor do we have the storage capabilities for every car in America to to produce 10 exabytes of data and get it back to the cloud and then store it, and then ultimately be able to use it. <coughs> just not capable, so that's why the, the, the car is probably, like I said, the, the biggest driving point for, for edge computing. Um, you know, from a technology perspective, you know, in 2015, NVIDIA released their, their Drive PX uh, chip. Uh, in 2017, uh, Toyota started releasing that chip under their cars, and, you know, the CEO uh, said that those cars are going to start debuting in a couple of years. Well, well, guess what? We're, we're, we're past a couple of years. So when we look at true autonomous vehicles, you know, Frisco has a game plan. They currently have, you know, we're seeing, you know, e-cabs all over the country. Uh, you know, those things are starting to happen. You know, right now Frisco has a program uh, where they're taking data from the Waze app, dumping it into their traffic systems so that now their traffic cameras can change on the fly based upon data that the users have dumped into the cloud and they've extrapolated into their traffic system. That's a fog application, you know, because we're taking that data a little bit farther away from the data center into the system architecture. And so that's where that differentiator <coughs> edge versus fog really, really comes in. Um, and then, you know, I uh, was uh, at a meeting in Atlanta a couple of weeks ago, and uh, one of the interesting, you know, we, we also want to talk about business cases. There was a, there's an ECAB company, uh, they've done a one-year pilot in St. Louis right now, and the interesting data that's coming back from those autonomous vehicles is that um, what they found from a commercial perspective, from a downtown St. Louis perspective, is that people are starting to shop in those areas longer. They're able to park their car farther away, uh, extend uh, their shopping experiences and things like that. So when we talk about revenue opportunities with some of these technologies, it may not necessarily be in connecting the car that's the revenue opportunity. It could be delivering the advertisement or the beacon ad from those retailers back into the car. Um, and then the last thing, you know, obviously from, uh, I don't want to, it's, it's, it's on the cars, um, oh, sorry, um, but obviously we all know about Uber Air that's happening, um, you know, in, in Frisco to DFW. Uh, that rolled out about a year ago, and they're saying that true 
you know, it'll be in full production. They were early 2020 was what they had hoped, but it looks like it's going to be about a 2023 time frame now. And those are just a couple of things that are happening in our backyard. Got a question here? Yes. Is FOG an acronym? And if so, what is the acronym? I don't think it is an acronym. I think it's uh, just a name similar to cloud. It's just a nomenclature okay. given to, you know, yes. Yeah, so cloud, fog, and edge, or, you know, I, where I've seen it is in the triangle, you know, diagram. And, and so no, it, from my understanding, it doesn't actually stand for anything that other than sense. just a nomenclature of understanding where it's geographic places and, gotcha. and the world. Right. I think we'll expect we'll see people continue to rip off of cloud after hearing about mist. <laughs> How is mist any different than fog? I don't know. <laughs> Density. Right, right. So I think that's part of the, the challenge today when we talk about edge computing. You know, many people are throwing edge into this, this pseudo cloud environment that we could call fog or mist, and I think we're we're not fully understanding the, the, the concept of the edge. Um, the other area that's truly doing edge processing right now are the cameras. And, and Ed mentioned it earlier, and I'll get to that in a minute. But, but um, uh, one, of, one of, you know, I'll, I'll read this because it was a quote. Real-time recognition of a constantly changing scene requires high data bandwidth and incredible amounts of storage if performed in the cloud. So this is a cost-benefit analysis for driving this, this compute to the edge. So what we're seeing, you know, there's a company called uh, AI Guardsman. Uh, pretty neat technology, however, it's going to have its limitations. Um, big use in retail environments right now. And what it can do is it can track you walking down the aisle of a grocery store. It can track what product you're pulling off of the shelf for marketing purposes. But the moment you take your hand or you decide you want to pull your phone out of your pocket, it understands that motion of your hand being lost and it contacts uh, store security. Now, I can see both sides of that picture, you know, all the false positives and, and, and things like that. But essentially what, you know, they're describing it is, is, is you know, the, the, the Kinect video game camera, but it's going to be, it uses 2D instead of 3D to track that. Um, like I said, a few false positives there, but, uh, but interesting tech on the, on the cell. There's another company out of Austin, uh, used to be a San Francisco based company and moved to Austin called Athena, and they've just released an AI solution that can, can, can detect firearms. Um, I was at Supercomputing 18 yesterday <coughs> and I saw a presentation by a company called Plano Intelligence. That's a new startup, actually. It's a bunch of UTD computer science students, and they have a pending patent on exactly that. And we saw an example of, uh, they, they had, a, it, as part of the demonstration, an example of processing a live video feed and detecting guns. Absolutely. So, so they're not the only ones in, in Austin. So huge opportunity, obviously, for schools, uh, municipality opportunities. You know, I, I hate to use the term smart cities too much but it will be a huge opportunity for what we're doing on the light poles um, in, in, that, in that realm. Um, and then, of course, uh, Ed mentioned it a few moments ago uh, with Edge Tensor, but um, a, a local company, and like I said, they're doing some really, really cool stuff. Um, like Ed mentioned uh, earlier, their driver monitoring system, the camera uh, at the roadway pole or at the traffic light can, can sense whether you're drowsy or distracted. Um, can then do a couple of things. Um, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna ruin it, but but then allows the trigger to happen whether it uh, contacts the car, whether it turns the light from green to red, uh, whether it sends. A, you know, all of that I think is is still in motion. But at the end of the day, you know, that capability of being able to to track and log that distracted driver uh, is is incredible. I think. Um, I think I read that uh, something like nine people a day uh, get killed by distracted drivers in the United States. Um, the other one that I really thought was very interesting as part of the uh, part of the solution that Ed's Tensor offers is obviously their their mood monitoring. So the capability of you know putting these cameras uh, in schools or in um, uh, youth scenarios for preventative uh, health for um, 
you know, psychological things. Um, so, so the capability of putting these mood monitors uh, in the classrooms for student engagement. You know, you've got a very boring teacher and we've all almost fall asleep in class before, but that camera can then uh, understand that mood, relay that data back to the teacher in a real-time environment so that they teach a little bit differently. So once again, Ed, uh, hopefully I didn't misspeak on, on that, but, uh, but, but, but pretty, pretty neat tech there. Um, and, and we're seeing more, you know, there was a company I uh, mentioned uh, a trip I took. Uh, there was another company that I talked to uh, out there called Robotics. Um, very interesting company. What they're going to be doing is they're going to be using cell phones on the dash of cars to be able to offer um, a municipality the ability to understand where road work and things like that is required. In that conversation, I said, well, how are you going to extrapolate that data to the autonomous vehicle? Or better yet, how would I get that on the roadway camera so that when a new pothole shows up, you know, the AI systems and the camera can hit your database and say, we need to go take this. And that's something they're working on. But, but once again, a pretty neat, uh, pretty neat technology from, uh, from that perspective. Uh, the other thing I wanted to chat about is, you know, the edge in your money. So one of the other uh, big opportunities and uh, other areas where they're starting to remote true edge processing uh, is at the ATM. Um, you know, digital currencies, uh, things like that. So, um, you know, obviously we're seeing right now the old, uh, you know, the, the concept of the NTTA, you know, used to have the, the little tags on your windshield. Now we can use the connectivity between our connected cars and our phones so that we don't need those anymore. Uh, we can use Bluetooth signals to get in and out of uh, turnstiles and things like that. So that would be the next thing that we see from a, from a, a digital currency perspective is that integration you know, into the true autonomous vehicles. The ability to pay for my cheeseburger as I'm driving through the drive through without having to give somebody my, my credit card or my wallet. Um, you know, or, or my, you know, or cash. I, you know, I can, I can use the car uh, to pay for that uh, cheeseburger as I'm rolling through the Burger King Park, you know, drive through um, The other thing that's uh, huge right now is uh, the debit credit uh, author authorizations with the facial recognition. Um, we're seeing that at the ATM level, uh, as well as uh, there's some, some of the new cell phone uh, pay applications will offer the capability of using facial recognition as a secondary um, uh, authorization form. Um, so, so that's pretty big. But, but uh, in a nutshell, you know, um, a couple of things here, and I, I wanted to use this quote for the very first slide, but then I, I lost it for, for this slide. But, but at the end of the day, the banking systems uh, want to use it to find stop, uh, find <coughs> stop non-compliant transactions. And uh, two quotes. The first one is, you know, when organizations have the time to have to take the time to move their data back to the data center, the lag time decreases the value of that data. So we can see it in a couple of different applications, autonomous cars and that right hand turn I was talking about. You know, real time data is not useful after 100 milliseconds. So, so we're starting to see that edge requirement move farther out. Still very early into the cycle, but the reason is, is, is you know, irrelevant data stored is, is, is a true cost that no one should, should have to bear, right? It's, you know, you know Joe over here the, in, in IT, you know, this constant problem of storage, well, if I'm storing crap data that's irrelevant, why don't I purge it and get it out of there? And that's some of the conversations about Edge and only sending pertinent data back. And then, uh, and then of course, you know, the, you know the, the head of Wells Fargo Innovation Group says it simply, simply here. It allows us to take the experience it would require a customer to navigate multiple web pages and we put it in the palm of their hand in a chat bot um, to a customer service agent. So basically the end result is making it easier from a customer service perspective and that's what drives uh, the banking. Um, and I apologize had I known uh, Morgan Stanley was the, uh, was the sponsor this morning, I probably would have gotten a few more Morgan Stanley quotes out there. <laughs> Um, the next slide, and 
You know, I'm, I want to be honest. I'm, I'm in the smart lighting business. You know, we've owned our controls platform, Netlink Controls, since 2008. Um, about two years ago, we rebuilt it on the LoRaWAN platform. And uh, quite honestly, um, the, the term smart is, is quite overused. You know, um, connected cities to build safe cities. You know, connected homes allow me to, to do some things that help my home be smart, but at the end of the day, just putting the Alexa uh, in my house doesn't make me a smart home. Um, but at the end of the day, there's a plethora of sensors, you know, 50 billion by 2025, a trillion of them by 2050. Well, who, who cares what the number is? But, you know, sensors are driving this thing, whether it be, you know, the sensors that we're putting on the light to adjust to the daylight sensing, or it's the sensors that we're putting on uh, the, HVA the HVAC machines to, to understand uh, mean time to repair, predictive maintenance, predictive analysis. Um, you know, same thing in the hospital environments. You know, we're, we're putting sensors on the MRI machines, but we're really not to what I'm gonna call edge computing yet in those industries. You know, healthcare requires HIPAA oversight, so what we may see and we may think we see at the edge with the Fitbits and the heart monitors, all that data has to go back up to the cloud where the secure environment is right now and then comes back out. So I didn't want to put healthcare in because it's truly not at the edge yet. We're, we're, you know, we're getting there. We're trying to get those decisions to be made at the edge. But... Um, what will happen is, is I feel that that will probably be more of a fog application because we're going to have to have some control somewhere. So whether it be a micro data center, you know, on the surgery floor or in the basement of the hospital still, um, you know, we'll have to have some form of oversight. Edge will get there and, and medical devices, uh, like I said, they're having to figure out the concept of HIPAA uh, and data privacy. Um, and then, um, you know, as, as Ed said, uh, you know, the, the, the deep learning um, and offering faster analysis, you know, whether it be uh, the, uh, the the camera with the AI opportunities with the Raspberry Pi device, um, you know, right now in the lighting business, uh, we are working on light fixtures for the roadways uh, that have compute capabilities built into them to offer some true edge computing capabilities. But one of the things we're also seeing uh, out there uh, are dual radio capabilities. So not necessarily, you know, the edge, but uh, edge compute, but how do I offer Wi-Fi access to the city park in a smart city environment while also controlling the lights in a safe and secure area manner? So what we're seeing is we're seeing dual band capabilities, whether my lighting system uses LoRaWAN and then we throw a Wi-Fi component and we backhaul that via 4G, 5G back back to the cloud for true Wi-Fi capabilities. Well, I've just thrown three different radios on top of a light pole. Well, is it edge? It's, it's edge enablement, but it's not truly edge computing. So I think as we move forward, um, you know, some of those, you know, some of those things will, will continue to wash out. <coughs> um, the last thing that I'm going to talk about, and uh, it's not on the slide, um, it's more lighting related than it is edge computing related, but it's a, a, a bleeding technology, bleeding edge technology, something called Li-Fi. don't know if many of you have heard of Li-Fi, L-I-F-I. It is the light version of Wi-Fi. <coughs> um, you know, the idea arose in I think 2012, 2013 by a fellow um, in Europe. Um, some of the applications out there uh, is be, being driven due to um, ultra security and capabilities and essentially the easiest way to describe it is <coughs> the difference between Wi-Fi and Li-Fi is if I go out of that this room I no longer have Li-Fi capabilities and no longer have to worry about the security situations arising out of connectivity outside of the room so um, uh, they just uh, retrofitted a, a, an aircraft carrier excuse me I believe it was the Carl Vinson, and the reason uh, it was such a good opportunity for them, obviously the carrier was made out of steel, terrible Wi-Fi signals, but also the ability for the 
um, ship's captain to be in his ready room with ultra sensitive data knowing that the person outside the door can't hack into that data. Starting to see a lot of applications around the Department of Defense as well as the other big application is in industrial manufacturing. Um, you know, a robot will take about uh, 30 turns every second and they now know that the RF frequency um, can impact those, uh, those robots on the manufacturing floor, so it's another big, uh, a big use case. Like I said, not, uh, not edge computing, uh, pretty far out of the realm of what we're talking about, but a pretty neat new technology. So that's, that's really all I have. Thank you very much.